Uh, I, I'm interested in uh, uh, Dr. Zul's answer on this evolution from uh, first generation to second generation of uh, of Islamists. Now, this is an this seems to be a form of evolution. Now, you you're arguing that the first generation uh, argued mostly on the Sharia or more, more li mostly on the legal side. But if you look, actually, the Islamic movement first started actually for a social justice, social economic justice. And then it evolved. For some reason, it was hijacked to the project of, of a more legalistic project. And now probably it's trying to go back to these roots of uh, this uh, economic justice. Like in the case of Tunisia, where, it, where, where Rashid Ganushi was very successful because of the idea of welfare state, again. So I, I'm trying to understand why this evolution happened, okay, one. Uh, and oh, this idea of going back to Makassid, actually Makassid is a progression, but Makassid actually stops. When he talks about wealth, he talks about the rights of, of, of ownership of wealth. He does not talk about uh, redistribution of wealth, where that is actually the main focus in the Quran. If you look, look at the Prophet, the idea of zakat is a pillar of Islam, and therefore it's actually a redistribution of wealth. But somehow this is totally neglected, as I asked my friend, why do you have so many Islamic banking conferences but hardly any zakat conferences? He says, one, you make money, one, you have to pay money. So who wants to pay money? So let's talk about how to make money. So the, I, I, I feel that the, this, this idea of negara kabajikan, which we, we used to talk about so much, is a very important idea. Somehow it got lost in translation. Uh, even now, the Pakatan doesn't talk about it that much. So I wish they do. Thank you. I uh, say. First of all, I feel very uncomfortable with the camera. I feel like Big Brother is watching me. And uh, uh, for serious discussion, it's very, very difficult. Uh, it will be going to be published in, uh, mes in uh, social media. It's going to be published. I'll be very, very careful. All right? Tawa, tawa. <laughs> okay, then I'll slow down. <laughs> Suddenly change paradigm. <laughs> okay. Um, Let's go a bit to that small issue regarding the launderette. And we see that uh, a lot of uh, rakyat, majority of the rakyat actually supported the idea of launderette for Muslims only, like the uh, president of Aswaja, Zamihan, Ketua Penerangan PAS, what's it? Nasruddin, and so on. They represent small parts. Yeah. Unfortunately, these people have this kind of. Uh, and the president of PAS also kept quiet on that. that, that it's a silent conspiracy. So we, we, from them, they have a strong influence on the, on the rakyat, ordinary rakyat you're talking about. Those who do not hardly read any books, only read the, uh, whatever that is available for them at hand. Now, uh, the question now is that uh, the Sultan has to step in, and that's interesting. When the Sultan step in, the issue settle. Uh, then they come again. But, it's, but it's so in, uh, at least in Johor. But it shows that, I realize that somehow, in this sense, secularism saves the Islamic discourse. Because in Malaysia, it's very unique. You have the Sultan, you have the PM, and the, and the Prime Minister, and, and the political party. The political party don't talk about any discourse. But the Sultan is the last person to issue the final edict, the final statement on the Islamic discourse, the Sultan. So I would say that how are we going to balance this? Even a political party come into power, any political come, party come into power. So you still have the, the what they call the Sultan controlling the Islamic discourse, which in a way is good because you have, I'm very supportive of Sultan Police and Sultan Perak. They are very supportive of multiculturalism. But in case there's a conflict between a political party, which is very multicultural, and uh, 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 what they call a, a sultanate, which is very monocultural, how are we going to gonna settle this crisis? Uh, thank you. Uh, maybe my question will be more theoretical. Uh, I pose uh, my first question to Prof. Hefner. Uh, so, uh, you said that uh, post-Islamism uh, movement uh, began in uh, after Iran Iranians uh, revolution, not re I think nineties, right? Uh, so uh, in this time, uh, we also know the the new movement of uh, what we call Islamization that uh, we all know coined by maybe the two prominent figure uh, by Al Faruqi and Al Naqib Al Attas. Uh, so if uh, the post-Islamism 
is a little bit to under bracket leave Islam, pro Islam to maybe to leave Islam, but Islamization movement. Uh, what I understood is uh, to turn back to Islam. So how this uh, uh, both ideas interplay each other. Thank you. And number two, uh, I post to Dr. Zulkifli Ahmad. Uh, you also draw into your talk uh, a discussion about Maqasid Sharia and uh, you, your party also uh, I uh, want to implement uh, the, the post-Islamist movement. So, Maqasid uh, Sharia, uh, I think, plays uh, an, imp an important role in the movement of post-Islamism because Maqasid Sharia is more practical, more uh, goal-oriented. Uh, in the meantime, we know that uh, Maqasid Sharia is really not not really goal oriented it has procedure it has a system uh, we know turukul kasaf uh, turukul isbat so they are they are procedure not really goal oriented so uh, in the context of partai amanah negara what you have previously and concurrently uh, done and to uh, dr uh, zainal bagir uh, you also subscribe to the idea of uh, Anaim in his book that if we if we if we want to be a good Muslim we uh, we need a secular state. Uh, if I'm not if I'm not mistaken, so we realize that uh, Sharia is the way of life. I think this is very common in our language. So why? In the level of a big matter, uh, which is Islamic, which, which is state, state matter, which is bigger, which is more important, we seem to to live to live Sharia. We need not hudud, we need not uh, a hudud, etc. So it seems uh, why is the Sharia is we of like why we, we seems to live Sharia itself. Thank you. Uh, this is a very interesting question about uh, the Islamization of knowledge and the relationship of projects of Islamization uh, like, like al of knowledge like those of Al-Faruqi uh, to post-Islamism. Has post-Islamism or whatever, this sh whatever term we use for this shift that is very notable and very widespread across Muslim-majority countries, has it impacted uh, the idea of an Islamization of knowledge? I'll answer in two ways. First, uh, the fact that there was that the the rise of Faruqi's understanding of an Islamization of knowledge coincided with the emergence of what today we're calling post-Islamism in certain parts of the world, particularly Iran, which was the first society that saw a kind of post-Islamist phenomenon. That coincidence reminds us that the temporality, the staging, the sequence of developments that leads to uh, a phenomenon that we broadly call post-Islamism varied greatly from society to society. Iran uh, was, uh, it, it varied both in terms of its temporality, but it also varied in terms of its focus, its concerns, and its cultural impact. As I said, so, so we have to, what I was trying to suggest in my remarks earlier today, is we should distinguish be between two currents or, or even two interpretations of post-Islamism. The one builds through the work of Asif Bayad, but it builds more directly on the experience of Iran, where post-Islamism has often been associated not with a reconceptualization and deepening of uh, Islamic ethical projects, but really with disenchantment and, yes, secularism. Iran is the most secular, not secular, secularist and that means anti-religious in this instance. Secularist Muslim majority country in the world. And that's, a, needless to say, as we all know, a very ironic outcome of the Iranian revolution. The second meaning of, uh, of post-Islamism, however, I think is the one that's more general. I, I, Asif Bayat does not suggest, and I think very few scholars suggest, that what we're witnessing in Iran with a, with a huge secularist surge is going to be the model of religious change and social change generally in other Muslim majority countries. No, I think post-Islamism or the second generation of Islamism 
in many other parts of the world uh, has to do with the kinds of things that we're talking about here uh, these past three days and in this panel this morning, in, in particularly not least in Patzul's, I think, very apt comment, comments, namely that we're dealing with a reconceptualization of both the instruments of Islamization and the aims, a kind of distancing from earlier simple solutions uh, and uh, simple understandings and I might say non-historical understandings of fiqh and sharia towards uh, a deeper appreciation of, first of all, the fact that there has always been great variety in the understanding of Islamic ethics and Islamic sharia, uh, and secondly, a recognition that one, those, those issues have to be re-engaged in contemporary times. So that's my, that's my opening answer. Now, very specifically, on the question of the Islamization of knowledge. Yes, the broader change that we've been talking about here, whether it's a civil Islam, whether it's post-Islamism, whatever it is that we've been speaking about over the last three days, has, yes, had a very dramatic impact on Islamization of knowledge projects, like those that were proposed by Farooqi. Uh, and I would say, and I, I'm going to, because time is short, I have to be much too simplistic about this, I would say, uh, the process that we've seen with regards to law and legal prog programs in the political sphere has also taken place with regards to knowledge. That is, there's a recognition that the earlier version on the part of many people, not all needless to say, just as there's still old style Islamists, there are also old style Islamization of knowledge proponents. But the shift that's been taken in the Islamization of knowledge I think is very, very tangible. You see it not least of all, for example, in economics, where there's been a move away from kind of simple, easy, already packaged answers, answers towards a recognition that no, first of all, one has to master a whole variety of sciences, whether they're called Islamic or not. They can be made Islamic and they should not be dismissed or disregarded merely because they have an etymology that, or a genealogy that links them to another part of the world. In this regard, I always take, if I take the pulse of my Muslim scholarly friends in Western Europe, in the United, thing, in the United States, the thing that has been striking is not that there's not an interest in the Islamization of knowledge, but that it really doesn't have to do, it has less to do with the Farooqi version and more to do with a, a recapturing of the spirit of Arabic and Islamic philosophy in the 9th and 10th century, where, let's not forget, there was not merely a translation of Greek philosophy into Arabic and into Islamic intellectual discourses. It wasn't just a translation movement. It was an engagement, a reappropriation, a deepening, and an enlarging of the tradition so that the tradition that is eventually five centuries later, four centuries later, passed on to the Christian Europeans in places like Sicily and Spain bears the striking imprint of a number of Islamic philosophies. European philosophy would not have been what it would become in the 15th and 16th centuries without the great scholarship, the remarkable scholarship, and I know he's a controversial figure because of some of his other views, but of Ibn Rushd. Ibn Rushd was the most seminal commentator on Aristotle for 400 years in the West. He was the way in which, and he was, he was of course, who he is. So, so there's, this, I end here. The Islamization of knowledge projects has ex experienced a kind of transformation, I think, in some way, I don't want to press this too far, but in some way analogous to what's happened to simple projects of political Islamization. That is, there's a recognition that, no, the world is complex, and one needs to draw on a variety of traditions of knowledge, not be exclusive, but recognize that knowledge and certain instruments of knowledge, certain sciences of knowledge, uh, are in fact a human creation and they can then be given, as with Islamic banking, they be can be given a distinctive Islamic chop, but it isn't to the exclusion of, if you will, other, tra other methodologies and other traditions of knowledge. So the Islamization of knowledge continues, but it's much less de corta corta can, yeah? It's much less <laughs> blocked off and it's much more part of an open and expansive transcultural and trans tradition 
dialogue. Uh, <coughs> yeah, I would carry on with Dr. Isham's. Um, <coughs> if I could put it simply, uh, this notion of a second generation political, Islamist political party, you know, came about, um, I wouldn't think that it is post Arab Spring either. It is a, 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 a gradual, you know, um, what I call perhaps a, an intellectual introspection of, of, of the political leadership of the Islamist movement. It is a gradual thing. You know how Erdogan, Erdogan left uh, Arbakan, how perhaps in the Malaysian context, how we left our former party. You know, so it's a gradual thing. So, but I would be more, uh, no, hang on. I, I would be more academic to say that, you know, it is, you see, first, polit first generation political party has its role. And the narrative, the historical narrative of it is essentially, it is because it is a, a, a response, a political response to post-colonial uh, subjugation of the Ummah and the, you know, the downfall of the Ummah, you know. And this idea, this, this whole infatuation of getting back the Ummah as one united Ummah, you know, brings about that idea of Islamic State. Even the, 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 the Khalifa, the Khilafah. Therefore, you have in that political narrative of essentially one that is strongly hinged on being, um, you know, everything against West, essentially of that uh, political, legal subjugation of the Ummah, you know, uh, of, of what has been imposed, seen as imposed on them. And what you know, we used to call this as the the kafir co constitution, lot read whatever. So you know, and then essentially, of course, uh, the dismantling of of the of the Sharia, seen as you know, essentially directed at uprooting the 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 the, the, the you know the the ummah, because the ummah is, and 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 unfortunately, is only seen from the perspective of of the corpus of legal prescription, namely the punitive law, rather than the entire Sharia that must you know, bring about total well-being of the Ummah. Hence, you have you know, an emphasis on legal, legality and legal reductionism. Everything reduced to legal. And if you solve this legal problem, you solve it all. So hence the reason why when Makar said it's revived, you know, and especially by the work of Ibn Ashur. Ibn Ashur's work, Ibn Ashur died, by the way, in 1978. Yeah, it's only, but that was a long gap of about 400 years between Ibn Ashur or the, uh, the work of, uh, uh, the work of uh, Ashatibi took 400 over years before it's again revived. And contemporarily, or rather, more current to our notion and to our and contextualized to our needs would be the work of Arashuni, Jasir Auda, yeah, and of course uh, uh, Al Ewani. Hang on, what you are saying to me, you know, you don't quite realize that this is why the door of Ishtihad, for as long as we still holds on to that. That's why I'm against this post-Islamism thing. Because it, it, it somehow, you know, doesn't see the context of why this Ishtihad is going to bring about a reinvigoration, rejuvenation, and the tajdeed of the Ummah, continuously. And if I may just address that, you know, Islam doesn't come with a model of an economic solution. However, imbibed within just not the verses of the Quran, but more importantly, the intents and objective of these verses, if I may quote, when God says, Let not the wealth revolve around the agnia, the rich and the super rich of you, it is indicating of the need of Makasid 
in terms of Hezul Mal. It's just not about preservation of Mal. It's about creation of Mal, creation of wealth, and its redistribution. Until you have a situation when, you know, in the time of Omar Abdul Aziz, there's hardly any Asnaf who entitle themselves to be queuing up to get the zakat. That is when Islam is being put in practice. Of course, this is maybe nostalgic, you know, it's historical. But we believe this referencing. No, if, if I, I understand that we always think of Maqasid in terms of Al Imam Al Haramain Al Juwaini, Al Ghazali. That is not, no longer. Those are very important. Those are Turas. Those are tradition. You know, we must be entrenched in tradition. But. The door of Ishtiyat allows us, opens it wide. Hence the reason why Islam is supposedly to be able to challenge or to undertake and to handle the change of time until the end of, um, until Yom al Qiyamah. Yani. So this is why we are in this conviction. It does not rhetoric or, you know, empty or whatever. Because this is the challenge of the Ummah, the challenge of intellectuals. The challenge of those, you know, a combination of the, of the, of the azkia, if I may, of the intellectuals, of the agnia, of the, of those that have got wealth and capital, of the umara, of the cap, of the political players and the ulama. So this is what is supposed to be, but of course, when you have power, you get corrupt. Absolute power corrupt you, absolutely. So, you know, you might may say, uh, that's how it is interlinked. Second generation come to respond that, look, we no longer could go by this narrative. That was why Erdogan and Abdullah Gul left Arba Khan and have AK party. Ganushi, in, them, in their own entity, transformed themselves. They do not require any and they do, they, do not, they do not suffer any split, but they transform. In the Malaysian context, you have it here. Even Jamati, Jamaat, Islami for that matter. And Ikhwan in Sudan, I happen to have exposure to, you know, I, I come from, from, from a very privileged, when I was studying overseas, I got to be exposed to all this. And I could see that. Perhaps I'm in a lot of ways, a, 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 someone, a product of a political Islam for, for a very long time. But it's because of this that compels me to be able to stand up and perhaps engage in whatever little ways that we could to have one, you know, that second generation political Islam that is able to contextualize the demand of of, of society and of, of of the nation states. And of course, I think uh, you, you get the idea that why did this first generation respond to anything Western, respond to the legal and everything, you know. Uh, so when second generation comes in, it identifies itself with, this is why, shifting away from Islamic State to the civil, civil state. This is not, it was as first espoused by the, 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 uh, the, the justice and, and party of, of Morocco, in fact, even earlier than, even earlier than uh, uh, Mustafa, no Mustafa Shibai, I've forgotten his name now. Uh, they were the ones a lot earlier, even pre Arab Spring, espouse on and advocate civil society as their objective of their political struggle. So I think that would suffice, perhaps, to share with you what little that I have. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah. The question is, why do we leave out um, Sharia from something which is very important, that is state, right? <coughs> uh, so I think even the notion trying to um, put together Sharia and state is paradoxical, <coughs> because the very notion of state is not Sharia. That is, the very notion of state is a very modern notion. Um, and trying to drag Sharia into state, that's not ennobling Sharia. 
tidak memuliakan syariah. It's even profanizing um, syariah. So <coughs> probably you take state too seriously. So <laughs> my advice is not to take um, state as something which is very lofty, so syariah has to be there. <coughs> um, probably the reverse. And um, <coughs> so, um, and you have to accept, um, well, I said um, state is not syari, probably that's um, paradoxical, maybe not very clear, but just take the example. Um, <coughs> I mean, now, now state is something we cannot um, um, deny. <coughs> I mean, it's a historical accident or historical contingency that we now live in um, nation states. Um, <coughs> but, um, well, you take the example, you, um, you take the example of um, <coughs> Saudi Arabia. Um, it's a kingdom, but also a state. And um, if you want to go to Hajj, you need a visa. And Saudi may deny you visa for different reasons. Um, so <coughs> that, I mean, um, do you see my, my point? I mean, um, sometimes it, it could not go together. I mean, we, we cannot avoid state, um, but it does not always help. <coughs> and um, so the, the question probably is um, if, if you don't want um, secular state, um, you want to implement Sharia, you don't want secular state, then what is the alternative? <coughs> well, we have the alternative now, um, um, the so-called Islamic state. Take the, the example um, Pakistan or Iran. Iran is Islamic Republic um, of um, Iran. <coughs> um, Pakistan is also an Islamic um, Republic. Both have totally different systems. And um, I don't say, I don't think you can say that either Iran or Pakistan gives a good example of Islamic State. Um, in Pakistan, you read the history, you know who has this idea of Islamic State in the beginning. It's the military. It's politicizing Islam. It's not bringing Sharia to a better place, but it's politicizing it. Um, Zia al Haq and others. <coughs> and you can see how, I mean, in this um, so-called Islamic State, um, many Muslims, they suffer <coughs> because of this. There's only one um, idea of Islam which is enforced by the state. And would you have trust in politicians? I, I don't say, uh, I don't mean uh, negative things. But um, I mean, would you trust your sharia, your religion, in the hands of the politicians, which, well, some of them may have probably good understanding of religion, like our friend. But most of them, probably not. I mean, they even, they, they play with, with um, religion. So. <coughs> Um, if you go to the classical um, examples, can you give any examples of, um, again, state is a very modern notion, but um, any, any example of um, Khilafah or anything? None, there's not, not a single one which I think is satisfactory. Um, <coughs> I mean, Khilafah comes and goes, and it, um, usually, usually it's all politics. It's repressing other um, views. Um, when the Mu'tazila um, comes in power, Mu'tazila is very rational and others, but it represses the, the other um, madhab, the Ash'ari. When the Ash'ari um, theology is supported by the Khilafah, then it suppresses the, the Mu'tazila. Um, so that's the notion which is um, proposed by an -Naim. If you want to get a freedom, better freedom as a Muslim, to be a good Muslim, then probably you, secular state will give you a better guarantee of that. Um, it's not a perfect notion, etc. I mean, like, I don't have um, imagination that state is the best ideal, but that's something that we live in. Um, and we work um, from this um, reality. Um, <coughs> And um, yeah, again, um, it, it's not, it's not um, trying to lift out Sharia um, from the state, but um, um, how to bring um, your Sharia aspiration in a better way, not by politicizing, by profanizing it. Um, <coughs> um, yeah, not, not lowering um, Sharia by, by um, um, giving it 
um, to the hands of the um, state. Okay. Okay, the, the, the idea of Sharia to only be meaning uh, uh, hudud and you know it's yeah. it's, it's completely uh, 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 if I may say antithesis to the whole maqasid. Yeah. Just for example, take a, take a verse of the Quran. That is a verse. It's categorical. It is, it is, you know, it is qatayat to dilala wa qatayat to subut. You can't, you can't play around with that verse. That is very clear that Allah commands you not to eat of one another's uh, uh, wealth through wrong means. And it's all about corruption. And it goes, the, the verse goes around to, you know, bribing uh, judges in that particular verse. And how does that verse relate to us in the entire polity and, 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 and policy of the government? Directly, you know, in terms of uh, whether it's whether it's in in the light of, of governance and others. So what what make you say that you know when you don't have Sharia, you know, on board in the sense of only the punitive aspect of Hudud, therefore you don't have Sharia. I, I can I can quote you many other verses. And this is only about 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 mal, hebzul mal. Yeah. How about? We have not addressed this brain drain. This brain drain, because you don't pro provide employment of the graduates that are unemployed right now, 25% of them do not get any employment six months after they have graduated, is, is a curse. And that is one of the responsibilities of a government in terms of creating the total well-being of the, of the, of the citizen, the, the riot. And that is about Hibzul Akal. Hibzul Akal does not only, you know, in the traditional sense of, you know, anything against uh, alcohol. That is certainly one aspect of how the ulama talks about it. But Hibzul Akal right now is about enhancing the intellect, a superior form of education that will bring about this nation to be comparative, graduates marketable, society virtuous, morally vibrant, vibrant, intellectually superior, and that is Ibn Akal. What makes you think only Ibn Akal is only in the, term, in, the, in the sense of only alcohol? Mm. Certainly that is one. So when you go to Makassid, this is how you discuss this. You know, it, 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 it's a systemic approach. It's an approach that talks about the ultimate of Sharia. What is the ultimate of Sharia? Rahmatan lil alamin. A total well-being of the entire humanity, not just Muslim. Rahmatan lil alamin, not rahmatan lil muslimin. Let alone rahmatan lil melayuin. <laughs> okay, thank you, Dr. Okay. Zul. Sorry right, to cut okay. you short. Right. I, 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 okay, I've, got to, I've got to seek for permission to leave abruptly. abruptly. Because I've, ah. I've got a program to attend to and oh. I've gone beyond my time. Okay. Uh, to. Can't you stay until 12 o'clock? We are ending soon. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>